So, Michael, we have our good friend, one of the unsung heroes of the theater. Yes, press agents are a very, very important part about how the whole Broadway jungle works. You probably know Sidney Falco in the... Uh, <laughs> one in of the, our role models. One of your role yeah. models. Thank you, Michael. In, in, the great, in the great movie, Sweet Smell Shoot of Success. Shoot me now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, she, she bears no resemblance at all to Sidney Falco. Thank you. She's straight above board, honest. I've been dealing with Susan Shulman for years uh, on the other side of the uh, of the table as we often mm -hmm. have sparred over various things over the years and she has taken us backstage literally backstage in her new book backstage pass to broadway true tales from a theater press agent welcome to theater talk thank you it's very all right, exciting Susan, uh all right let's um let's start dishing right away shall we? <laughs> you worked uh at the end of his glorious career with the great producer david Merrick. i did and can you give us a sense of just going into a meeting with David Merrick at the end of his life? Well, let me preface this by saying that I grew up on David Merrick shows. I mean, I saw Fanny and Carnival and Stop the World and Hello oh, Dolly and all. Hello Dolly voice. I mean, I grew up on David Merrick shows. So the first time David Merrick came to my office was big stuff. Yeah. That was pretty big. Mm -hmm. And that was the good news. The bad news was that by that time he'd had a serious stroke and he couldn't walk or talk. So, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> other than that, it, no. But I mean, he was sort of in there. He, he. There were times when you felt absolutely that he was with us and he was communicating in some way, or pointing, or thumping, or whatever he was doing to to make a point. Mm -hmm. And there were other times when you felt he wasn't. So it was a very peculiar uh, setup. Right. And of course, I went into this knowing all the stories about David Merrick and all the you know that you know people. Some people loved him, and a lot of people didn't love him. People feared him, and people feared him, and so. It was, um, it was a very weird situation to be in mm -hmm. because on one hand it was David Merrick, it was this titan, mm -hmm. and he had certainly, certainly knew far more than anybody else in the room. On the other hand, he wasn't always a participant. You were a doing State Fair then, right? This was during State Fair, which started as a Theatre Guild production right. and was really never intended to come to Broadway. It was intended to be another string in the Rodgers and Hammerstein bouquet of shows right. but it did really really well on the road and people loved it it was like comfort food people yeah. just loved state fair i remember it being a charming production but it was the thing dear. was that it was uh, it all the, the whole story became about merrick well and the merrick nonsense and insanity which when, tell us what was going on well what happened was that the the people that were really behind all of this which was which was the theater guild and some other people wanted to kind of recreate merrick's heyday when he was very much um, a troublemaker. I mean, he loved to take on his adversaries, just as you do, Michael. Thank you. And he would <laughs> a he pot would, stirrer. He was he was stirring the pot. And so we one of the things we did, which was really without Merrick's participation, in all honesty, was we created a, a campaign um, that were memos from Merrick, mm -hmm. and they were kind of snarky and tongue in cheek, and they kind of made fun of other shows that were on Broadway. And, every, and you put those in advertisements in the newspaper. They were New York Times ads. And we used this old photo of Merrick in his heyday with his, you know, hat on his, you know, angled and his gold tip cane. And I mean, it was, it was great. And what nobody really picked up on was that he really wasn't involved. He wasn't writing memos. <laughs> he wasn't writing the memos. <laughs> yeah. And he wasn't really, I don't know if, even know if he saw them, actually. Mm. But they were fun and they were snarky and they were kind of, you know, yeah. giving everybody a little zits yeah. and uh, people wrote about it because it, it, they were fun. Right. When you say there was still a little of the old Merrick left though, what did mm -hmm. you see specifically in him? Was there any moment or well, something that he did that uh, you thought that is the great man I'll still I'll tell you, if, if ever there was somebody who knew about billing, it was David Merrick. <laughs> and one of the, at the very first meeting I had with him, yeah. I had created two layouts, two uh, uh, billing pages State Fair, and it was at a time when Merrick and, and his and his companion had come into the show, and she was billed as a, I think, as a co-producer. Natalie uh, Lloyd. Natalie Lloyd. And so David and, and Natalie came to my office, and I presented them each with the two different A and B. Right. And one was, in my opinion, a much stronger placement of her billing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the proverbial box, you know, right. it wasn't, but, but it was... David Merrick presents an association Well, that with, part was, yeah. th that was all set. That was very much. It was, it was David Merrick Presents, the Theatre Guild production of Rodgers and Hammerstein State Fair. There were a lot of words up there. But, <laughs> but Natalie's billing was, was the particular issue with that day. And so I, present, I presented Mr. Merrick and Natalie both with two versions of the, of the billing page. And he looked at them and he immediately went, this one. 
and she looked at them, and because he said A, she picked B. Just, just, I think that was the nature of their relationship. It was very kind of yeah. adversarial in an in, in interesting way. And in the end, she won, which was interesting because she didn't win. You right. know, because in fact, his what he had indicated was was the better. But you, film. as the press agent, are in no position to uh, not up to no, me. Nope. No. The thing that most impresses me about uh, good press agents mm -hmm. is their diplomacy in the face of some very difficult egos. It's a challenge. It is a challenge, and I have to say, writing this book is very interesting for me because I'm someone that has spent my entire career making other people look good. Mm. That's my job. My job is to make sure that, you know, everything is in place and that you know what the situation is and you know who you're being interviewed by and you know what the pros and cons are and you know. And for me to be the one in the spotlight after all these years is very odd <laughs> and a little bit uncomfortable. Welcome to the hot seat. I know. <laughs> it's not, it's not an interest, it's a very interesting transition. Well, I always thought though a press agent's job is is doubly difficult because you've got to deal with the client, mm -hmm. a David Merrick or a Lauren Bacall. You've mm -hmm. worked, you know, you've worked with all the greats. But well, on the, the other hand, you have to deal with the equal, Michael Riedel. Michael Riedel. Even diva esque people like the press. Yes, this is the true. Michael Riedels of the world. And back, you know, when you were beginning, I mean, the, those big columnists like Liz Smith mm -hmm. and um, Earl Wilson, and, and these right. people. I mean, we are divas in our own right. So you have yes, to juggle. You are. <laughs> <laughs> of all, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the columnists that you dealt with. Um, who, which columnist of all did you did you like back in back in uh, in your day? Who had the most power? My <laughs> day, my day is still <laughs> here. You. My God, I'm still Thank doing you it. So well, I mean, but, Thank the, you. but the Broadway newspaper well, column is kind of dead. I'm the, I have the only one left. But when you they, were starting up, they were all over the place. They were all over the place. And the interesting thing was that everybody, there were there were column guys that spent their entire day crafting column items specifically for. Earl Wilson, or specifically for Ed Sullivan, or whoever else. Yeah. Those were the two when I was first starting, and, they, and believe me, they didn't talk to me. I was, you know. Yeah. Um, but Leonard Lyons, too, right? Leonard Lyons. I actually grew up with Leonard Lyons' son. But um, those columnists had their own style, as you do. They, they had a particular way of writing, like Cindy Adams, you know, has a kind of style. And, and so there were guys that spent all day, that's all they did, in the Bill Dahl office, which was the first press office started, I worked yeah. who was one of the grand old men of the press, uh, press agents. And they would run the way those guys they in the press were, office had written them. each one was exclusive, so you never sent the same item to somebody else until you got it. And Oh, and they would all send it back if they weren't going to use it. You huh. would get it back the next day. So you could s sell then, it to somebody else. And then else. you could rewrite it for the next column, or another columnist. When did you start meeting some of these people? When do you rise up uh, as a press agent to well, the I you think actually get to meet I, Mr. Lyons? I Mr. think as, as you, you know, begin to have your own office and you begin to be a little more of a grown-up right. press agent, you right, know, right, you right. And, uh, did you graduate. Did you, did you I like met all you. these guys? I you. Well, we met at Leslie Warren, which we'll get to it. <laughs> did you like all these guys, or were there any of them who were really sort of imperious the way we think of... Um, uh, J.J. Hunsecker in Sweet Smell of Success. Were they like just I a, never, loved to exercise their no, power? No, I don't think. I think that day was long gone by the time I came into the picture. I mean, I really don't think. I think it was much more of a collaboration between the press agent. Yeah, and, the, and I th and I think it still is. I mean, I've said this before, but I think we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. I I feel that way about critics. I feel that way about journalists. I think we're all in this together. Now remember, Susan, always tell the truth. This is true. All right. I, this, is, this is one of my <laughs> Well, mottos. Susan and I first met because you were uh, uh, repping um, the Johnny Mercer uh, show, Dream. Dream. Right. And the Which star. Which is really, uh, there's a chapter in this book that's really the Michael Riedel chapter. I know. Thank you very yes. much. I, mm -hmm. I, I certainly read that part. Um, <laughs> and we met. I was memorized. I was probably. a young, uh, you know, scrappy little reporter there at the Daily News. Mm -hmm. And Leslie Ann Warren was the star of Dream. She was. And I began sort of picking up rumblings that she was... As if by wizardry. <laughs> right, <laughs> that she was uh, difficult and very weird. Not very through strange. me. No, because that would be the last thing you'd do. Oh, my yeah. God. Well, no, I it think wasn't the thing I called you, you on... You had a mole. You had a good mole in that company. Oh, I had a lot of moles. I'm sure you did. And didn't she, like, she hated a chair or a sofa, and she just <laughs> one day walked up to it, and she rip, ripped it. Well... And that's what I called you. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> here's the thing. Sometimes actors get in their own way. And, you know, they're, they're talented, they're beautiful, they're, ta you know, they have a lot going for them. But there's some actors that get in their own way, is, is a polite way of saying it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think she's one of them. I think she's somebody that, you know, you look at her and you think, well, why isn't she a huge star? She's she was beautiful. Beautiful, talented, yeah. she can sing, she can act, you know. And, and I think that there's, there's other parts to the picture that maybe the public doesn't always see. And in that show, 
some of that behavior you brought out to the public. So what do you do when a columnist such as myself calls and say, hey, Susan, I hear your star is behaving badly backstage. The cast hates her. She ripped the sofa <laughs> up. She's impossible. I mean, when you get that call, what, what does your blood chill well, for a moment? Yes, what, what it do you does. <laughs> it does. And you think, oh, my God, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And in this case, obviously, you did have a mole in the company, and, and the reports were correct. And unfortunately, some of that behavior was done in front of 20 or 30 people. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, I'm not going to lie, because, you know, she did it. And if she did it and people told you, uh, there's no point in denying it. You and, know? and also, beyond you being an ethical person, you can't lie to somebody like Michael, because then he... You then the relationship well, yeah. between the, the, the exactly. reporter and the president You're not going to trust me. Exactly. And, but on the other hand, I, I, I think I did say to you, oh, Michael, it must be a very slow news day if you'd want to write about this. <laughs> Listen, that's one of the, Surely there's something more those interesting. Those are one of the columns that made my career, darling. That's I know. I make my I living know. on bad behavior from I, Diva's backstage. I, I always said that I think Dream was your favorite show. I love Dream. so many was, interesting things went on. It was a dream come true. Now, do you, when, when I call with information uh -huh. like that, do you have to go to the star? Did you have to go to Leslie's dressing room and say, uh, Michael Riedel of the Daily News mm. is going to write a column that's going to cast you in an unfavorable... No. How do you handle that? No, I mean, what happened was I did talk to the producers and they were aware of it, but but it happened. And it happened in front of a lot of people. And so it happened. Very quickly, um, of all the great stars that you worked with, do you have a particular <laughs> favorite, somebody that you really just... Mary Martin. Why? She was magical. I, I, I started as a, a kid. I was a fan. I stood outside stage doors waiting to see her, not wanting her autograph. I wanted to tell her how she enhanced my life. And um, eventually, the fandom turned into two professionals in the business. She was very generous and kind to me. And at, towards the end of her life, I had an opportunity on a radio show, a live radio show, to kind of rescue her and to pay her back in, in some small way for her kindness to me. Because her mind was a little... No, 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 no. Somebody said something rude oh. uh, on a live radio show. It About was when her. she was doing Do Your Turn Somersaults in, at, at the Kennedy right. Center. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to sort of save the day. Not, no, she was fine. It was, it was saving an awkward moment. And I, I was so grateful because I had a chance to, some, in a teeny little way, pay back to somebody that I had really idolized my whole life. Uh, the show, uh, the, the show. The, the show, the It's going to be a show. It could be adapted into a show. Who knows? Backstage pass to Broadway, true tales from a theater press agent. If you love uh, the sweet smell of success and showbiz <laughs> and the old columns, uh, and, this is the book for you. And, and it's full of good advice, mm -hmm. including at the end you say, I don't believe all publicity is good publicity. Sometimes we just need to shut up. Just what I wanted to ask you about some other people you <laughs> ran around with back in the day. All right, Susan Schulman, the book is Backstage Pass to Broadway, True Tales from a Theater Press Agent. Oh, zero Mustel stories you won't believe. Exactly. Hair-raising zero Mustel stories. Thanks for being our guest tonight. Thank Talk. you.